We're going to discuss what school and district leaders can do to promote inclusive beliefs and practices that support each and every learner to gain the skills, motivation, and engagement to gain challenging and meaningful learning opportunities. So we have longtime administrators and UDL experts, Katie Novak and Mike Woodlock here with us today, and they're going to share some secrets and strategies for putting the inclusive principles of UDL into effect today for school and district leaders. So I am so thrilled to be a part of this conversation, but before I introduce them, you know what I like to do in these is just hold off introductions to make sure that we um, take care of a few logistics at the beginning. So like all of our cast free webinars, we want this to be a conversation with you. This isn't just a presentation, but a conversation. So if you're joining us live today, welcome. It's fabulous to have you. Please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat panel. Um, you can open the chat panel from the center of the bottom of your Zoom window and you can choose everyone from the drop down menu above where you type so everyone is able to see your comments. So we do invite you to share your ideas, your reflections, post questions throughout the discussion and we'll, we will do our best to answer them in one form or another either during the conversation or follow up with you. If you're joining the chat later, welcome to the recording. We're so happy that you're here. Um, you can still continue to share um, in the conversation. You can share through Twitter, hashtag CastPL, at Cast underscore UDL, at Katie Novak UDL, and at Woodlock Michael. So whether you're joining us live or on the recording, this conversation can continue beyond the span of this hour. We also want you to know that all of the resources or links that we share in the conversation today will be available for you on our digital handout. And that is bit.ly slash UDL playbook dash webinar. So know that all of the links and resources will be available. And we see folks coming in from more from Montana, uh, Ohio, Illinois. We have international representation from Australia, from Spain, from Ecuador, and all across the US. It's just fabulous to have you all here today. So with those introductions, I am thrilled to introduce um, I'm thrilled to introduce our authors. So internationally renowned, she almost doesn't need an, uh, an introduction, but internationally renowned education consultant, um, graduate instructor at the University of Pennsylvania, a former assistant superintendent of schools in Massachusetts. We have Katie Novak with us today. Is she in the house? Katie is trying very desperately to get on our hotspot. So Okay, so Katie will be here momentarily. You all will appreciate that she has been working with educators all day and is, um, is negotiating the traffic to get to us. So also here is innovator, uh, innovative administrator, consultant, and graduate instructor with 25 years of experience in education, currently the principal of Groton Dunstable Regional High School in Massachusetts, where he has carried out a strategic plan that transformed the school through UDL. Mike Woodlock, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's awesome to have you here. So the first thing um, that, that we want to do is be able to get uh, the chat going. And so before we begin, we wanna know what are some burning questions you have about UDL leadership? And we're going to give you a couple minutes to brainstorm and put ideas for us in the chat. So what are some burning questions you have about UDL leadership? Great, how to support teachers getting started so they don't feel overwhelmed. I have to tell you, overwhelmed is a word we've heard a lot in the last two years. Hey, how Allison? do you get buy-in? Oh, is, Mr. Swift is in the house. Hello, hey, Mr. Swift. how are you? This is Swift, this is Katie's DJ. Do you want me to place a, a, a little background music while you guys uh... Play us a little background yeah, music. And if it's distracting to anyone, you can mute. We have about one minute left for this question. Much. 
Yeah. So we have some, some questions around buy-in. I like this word, you know, integrating UDL into systems and current practices, reassuring staff that they can do it igniting the passion for educators who are feeling this burnout and they feel like their plates are already full, um, communicating with parents and other stakeholders, convincing the why, hooking teachers on UDL, specific questions around math teachers. So a lot of really great, great questions to, to kick off this conversation today. So as we jump in um, and, and we're holding these questions and these ideas in mind, Mike, what inspired this book for you? Um, it's an interesting way to put it, actually, because if you know, <laughs> but you've, you've been to rock concerts, you know, when they have someone open up for them, that's pretty much what's happening here. So Katie is the main show. And, um, so I've, I've had the privilege of, of working with Katie and learning from Katie, uh, kind of side by side for six straight years. And one of the reasons why I came to the district that I'm in now is because I, I wanted to learn more about UDL. It was something that I was really interested in and it was a great opportunity for me. Um, so, you know, what inspired me to do it was basically Katie said like, we're writing a book together. And since so she had already written eight books, um, I just kind of went along. So, um, but well, I, I, I'm going to stop you right there, Mike, and say just kind of went along with the fact that you are supporting implementation of UDL across your district and having some really exciting things happen. In fact, right before the conversation, when you all were coming in, Mike and I were talking about how he's inspired some open honors classes where there are what, over 41 now open honors classes, you said? Yep. We started with seven sections in freshman English, and now we have 41 across nine through 12. So that's a little teaser to say, you're not just sitting back, but some things are happening with you uh, in this, this, um, this adventure, this UDL journey that we're on. Katie that's, just maybe has been on the journey a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah, but she's the inspiration here. You know, she's the one that pushed this. And I, I think that also speaks a little bit to like some of the questions that were coming up, like how do we ignite this? How do we spark it? It takes someone that truly believes to kind of make others believe and give them the, the push that they need to get going and push in that direction. What um, helped you so believe? I would say that's yeah. my, my inspiration was Katie. You know, she said we could do it. She believed in it and she made me believe in it too. But did you also feel tired and concerned and um, what made you think, all right, maybe, maybe I can start trying something? Yeah, I mean, I think any educator, especially after the last 18 or 19 months feels tired, concerned, and worn out and all those things. But um, I think we all also believe, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. You know, you know, can we improve on what we're doing? And, um, you know, I, we both thought like what we're doing here, it's not perfect. And we haven't written the book. The, the book isn't like do what we do and it'll work out perfectly, but it's like you can make a huge improvements. And so, you know, that was that was what we were shooting for. Well, I'll say it's never been a conversation with Mike and Katie without one of us being in the car. So from the car today, <laughs> we have Katie Novak. Katie, you're here at a perfect time. Mike was just, we had DJ Swift. We've had a number of questions come in already on how do we inspire this? How do we really support educators who are already feeling like their plates are full? What inspired this book for you? Oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. I can tell you're talking. <laughs> hey, Katie, do you have the Bluetooth on in your car? Maybe that's why. As Katie's working on that, I'm just going to also, I'm going to mention a couple words that come up a lot when you read this book. There are patterns of growth and there's expert learning and there's taking risks and there's trying it, there's collaboration. You're gonna see words like equity and inclusion, no ceiling on being a leader. Um, so this book is really all about being supportive, about thinking about quick tips that you can start immediately to get started, but also flexibility and variety so that we're making sure that like Mike said, what they did in their district isn't what you have to do, but that you're gonna find your own pathway for doing this to build this expert learning. Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh my goodness. Okay, everyone, for all of you who know, 
whenever I'm like about to freak out and I'm trying to problem solve, I always say like hashtag expert learner, be an expert learner. And my plan A was to leave an in-person presentation and get home in time. And then traffic got really bad. So plan B was to go to Mike's house and then traffic kept getting worse. And I don't know of like feelings that are more frustrating than being in the car and watching your ETA just keep getting longer and longer and longer. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to pull over. I'm going to do it for my car. And then my Wi-Fi and my hotspot wasn't working. And so thank you to Target who is giving me free Wi-Fi right now from their parking lot. I'm very appreciative <laughs> and I am here. But did you have a clear about- goal and you encountered some barriers and you had to use your problem solving expert learning skills to get here? I love it. We can apply UDL to anything. So oh, you- <laughs> yes, yes. And, and everyone, you have to tell me, I can see the chat, like, what do you do in this scenario? Like, I honestly was like, deep breathing, deep breathing. And then I'm like, ah! Like my coping <laughs> mechanisms broke down, but I am here now. So Shara is here. I, I am thankful I made it too, but tonight I might need like a couple of cups of chamomile to bring it, bring it down, bring it back down. <laughs> so I mean, what inspired this book? Yeah. What brought you have, you have a few other books. Why this one? What was so important that you knew there's another one in here that you had to share? So I think that one of the things that we talk about a lot is just how sometimes UDL is focused on as being really theoretical and, you know, recognizing just how necessary it is to create more equitable and inclusive and diverse systems. And we talk a lot about why we're doing this work and what UDL is. And what I have found that given the bizarre world that we're living in right now with COVID, the question that we hear most often is like, how? How do we do this work? And Kristen Rodriguez and I had talked about this in universally designed leadership as kind of like a zoom back, like as we're creating a real vision for change and strategic planning. And we worked with a lot of like building administrators and curriculum coordinators who are like, okay, so I understand that we have this big strategy and, you know, we're going to take four to seven years to really lean into full implementation of this work. But like, what do I do now? And so I think that what we tried to kind of share was in our own kind of practice, we realized that, you know, yes, there's things that we can do someday. And that's really important because the system took centuries to build and we have to deconstruct it. But like, you know, my kid only gets one year in first grade. And so what are we going to do Monday? And, you know, we used to have a colleague in common who used to say, talk about what you're going to do someday, but then you really have to get down to what you're doing Monday. And we wanted to create something that was kind of a, a guidebook to say, what can you do right away? Like connecting UDL to educator evaluation, modeling UDL within your faculty meeting structure, helping to make a through line between like core values and future ready and the you know picture of a graduate and expert learning. And so helping leaders to kind of devour the book and say, even though strategically, we may not have the system that students deserve and, you know, it's absolutely their right. There are things that we can do that like support educators better so that they can support a more diverse group of students in ways that are really meaningful. And there's a a video here from uh, Seinfeld. (laughs) Would you like for me to click play on this? Well, I have to tell you the story behind it first. Yes, so I definitely want to hired. know the story behind this. <laughs> yes, so Mike was hired as a new administrator. I was the assistant superintendent in a district, and he was hired as the principal. And, like, I didn't know him yet. And the first day of our admin retreat, I, I got stung by a bee and had, like, a gigantic hand. Like, it looked like some Hollywood effect. It was like a Hulk hand. And I had just met him, and he was like, I just can't stop thinking about the Seinfeld man hands episode. <laughs> <laughs> because I had this like, hi, nice to meet you. And so he showed this at our very first <laughs> um, admin retreat together. And he's like, this is all I can see when I see you. And so that was like how I knew that we would be like besties forever is because when he met me and I engulfed his hand in my like bee stung swollen hand, this is what he saw. It was very intimidating. 
<laughs> but you know, that almost, I mean, it does almost make, when we first meet students or when we first meet our staff, we, there is something that often sticks like that to us. And it's important to recognize the context is everything. You only have a huge, giant, swollen whole can when you've been sung by a bee. The context really, matters. I'll tie it all to UDL always, always. I mean, very, let me just say, Allison, that my hands are pretty strong most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I love about um, about this book is that you really are framing this um, this as a journey, and this is a journey that we can all go together. This continuum of growth, and um, and I think this image speaks to me about the journey that you all have you know started to describe. So what are some of the key ideas that you hope the folks who are listening here today take and start running and spreading from this book? So I think one of the things that was so cool for me is as we started doing research on just leadership in general and, and organizational change, we started learning about this concept of like an open system. And, you know, a closed system is one where you can become a one trick pony and you can just like continue to repeat the same thing over and over again, like assembly line ish. And an open system is one that you always have to use feedback to make slight shifts. And so like, if you're driving on a road, even if you're on a really straight road and in theory that shouldn't require much from you. Like it shouldn't really require you to have to steer too much. Even that system, which is fairly unchanging, you still have to shift a little bit. You still have to like pay attention to your foot on the pedal. You still have to watch all around you. How close am I to other cars? Like, do you have to swerve away from branches? And the feedback that you get in the system requires you to continually change. And we kind of made the argument that in many times we think about our own variability as leaders as being kind of like an interpersonal variability as opposed to like an intrapersonal variability. Like this is my strength as a leader. And it's like that doesn't exist in an open system because everything that is a strength or a limitation is really contextual. And so when I first became an administrator myself, it was like, okay, so this is what I'm good at and I'll just keep doing it. And the problem is, is that we're working in a system that's requiring us to make changes all the time. And even in a system with very little change, like a straight road, you still have to be really like vigilant of like being socially aware and, and being really self-aware. And if leadership is an open system and even a system with very little change requires us to make big changes. Like, what does that mean in like the, the world that we're currently living in? You know, what does that mean being a leader right now post COVID? And it's just that like, are we truly focusing on the impact that our leadership has on other people? Are we like recognizing that on this road, every intention that we have as educators ultimately leads to an impact in the people we serve. And that's the work of Beverly Daniel Tatum, who talks about like the work is not about our intent as leaders. It's about our impact on families and staff members and students. And I think that sometimes it's like, I'll talk to other leaders who it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we're asking people to make all these changes and change is so hard, but like we have to look at the mirror and realize that we have to make really, really extensive changes in our own leadership practices. And, you know, we can talk about kind of some of those, but it's, I think sometimes as, as leaders, administrators, we kind of get comfortable and like, oh, this is a strength of mine. So I'm going to ride this out. And it's, we're not paying attention to, but what is the impact on the people who we're serving? Mike, do you want to take a, take a pass? Yeah, I think um, if we stick with the, the journey and the open road, um, and, you know, one of the things that, that people are so concerned about if they're beginning to implement UDL or considering it is, you know, where do you start? And the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, right? So you just have to kind of decide you're going to do it uh, and make that decision and, and have people that are also in it with you that are going to check you. You know, you, if you're going to go and try and lose weight, it's best to get a couple of people together and we're going to do this together and you have someone to run with and you have someone to check you and make sure that you're keeping focused on your goals. Uh, and that's where you, you have to start with that first step and just decide you're going to do it as a team. Um, and even if it's a small step, you, you take a step in the right direction. And as soon as you make that step, as soon as you decide you're going to do it, things will start getting better. 
you all are sharing so much. So I love the brain and neuroscience. There's a lot of what you're saying that aligns with what our nervous system does. And that is that you don't just have bottom up information come in from the outside, just like you don't have teacher change happen. And that's what's going to instill change. You actually also have to have top down and bottom up interacting. And another thing that you just mentioned that reminds me of something in your book is uh, you describe needing to uncover the professional blind spots. And so part of not, you know, just setting on, um, what is it, cruise control and going down your journey and just kind of being on there, this whole idea of uncovering these blind spots that we might not be aware of to help um, explore opportunities for us to really deepen and change and, and get that feedback so that we can continue in this open system to grow and change. So what are some of the blind spots that you found um, you know, may exist in schools, may exist in the systems that we're in? You know, I, I, I think that, I mean, we live within blind spots. You know, I think that, you know, everybody, you know, we have our own identity and that identity leads us to certain beliefs. And, you know, I think that one of the things we have to recognize is like our way is not the way, it's a way. <laughs> and I think that sometimes within leadership, it's like, well, this is the way that I do it. And like, this is what's good for teachers. And within that, if we don't really optimize the voice and choice and the perspective of the people we serve, there's like this real potential of not getting that right for everyone. And so I think that like everything that we do, we almost need a mirror of like the impact of the work that we're doing. And so, you know, one of the things that we advocate for is, is trying to create a culture where you really can ask for feedback, because we often talk about you know, teachers asking students for feedback. And, you know, I'm a graduate instructor and I don't want to wait till the end of my course to ask kids, if kids, oh my gosh, I literally work with adults. I don't want to wait till the end of my course to ask learners to, to let me know where I haven't met their needs because it's almost too late. And so how do we really ask for feedback in an ongoing way, but also create kind of a space where people feel safe enough to like give you that honest feedback. So, you know, when we say to teachers, like, you know, I want to give you a survey and I want to share with you some prompts. And I really honestly want you to recognize the power of feedback in your own practice. And if you were to ask students for feedback, how it could really help you. And I want to be vulnerable and recognize that I, I know that there's going to be some of you who I'm not yet meeting your needs. And the best professional development I could give myself is to listen to you. And, you know, to really understand the impact of my leadership on you. Do you feel supported? Do you feel like you have the skills and the resources? And if not, then like, what could I do differently? And, you know, I think that everything we do is essentially up for a reflection on the people who we serve, although it's like painful to do that. But we can't shift a system if we're not willing to model the importance of shifting that system. And so if we say that the best way to correct within an open system is to rely on feedback, but how often do we really ask for feedback? And I don't mean like faculty meeting, raise your hand if you don't like my leadership. Like mm -hmm. that's, that's not going to be, you know, baking a lot of chocolates or cookies. But if we can really say, I, I recognize my own limitations. I know that I struggle with some aspects. And I just want you to know it's okay that we struggle with this and that we're all going to like lean into getting better together, but I need your honest feedback on whether or not you're feeling like you're being supported and what I could do differently. And, you know, specifically, like, I would love to know kind of how, I think one of the slides that's coming up next is really all about like how we truly ask for feedback. Like, are we making a concerted effort to say to the people for whom we serve, whether it's our families, whether it's our staff members, whether it's, you know, educators or students, you know, not necessarily like, you know, how am I doing? Because then all you get is like an answer, good, bad, that's an evaluation. But like, how could I better support you? What specifically could I do so that you don't feel like you're drowning, so that you feel seen, that you don't feel invisible? Because I feel like, you know, as leaders, we can't necessarily change everything but we can certainly acknowledge everything and allow people to feel heard and to allow them to express their feelings. And we talk about social emotional learning in classrooms, like give kids permission to feel. And there's this very interesting culture of like toxic positivity with adults. Like kids can feel drained, but like be grateful for your job. And it's no, 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 no. Like we have to have adults feel as though it is completely, I, I see you for being 
drained. I see you for being frustrated. I see you for knowing that you're working way too damn hard to not have a greater impact on all kids. And so I know that I can't change everything, but I know I can change something. And what can I change so that you feel seen, that you feel heard, and ultimately you can better meet the needs of a really beautifully diverse and inclusive group of kids. What were some of the first changes, Mike, that you remember making? Oh, I mean, um, I was definitely doing 60 minute uh, staff meetings where it was just me running through some slides. Uh, and that takes, I mean, that's a really hard change, honestly, because there is so much information that you're expected to get out to staff. Uh, so it was finding ways to get creative so that that 60, a lot of that stuff doesn't have to come from my mouth to their ears in front of them and finding opportunities for um, staff to be part of the staff meetings rather than just people that I spoke at. Um, and I, that feedback part is, is incredibly important. And that's really hard for leaders, just like it is for teachers to ask students for, you know, how do I get better at this? Because you're giving up something, you're becoming vulnerable. Um, but it's also super important. Like we, we all have weaknesses, even though we, we try to hide them all the time, right? Katie, what was the stat? Like 90% of administrators polled oh. felt that they were in the top 10% of all administrators. Yes. Right? That, that was like, it made me so sad. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. So we're not all in the top so say 10%. that stat one more time, 90% of. So Harvard Business Review did a, a research study, which we cited in our book, and 90% of leaders who were interviewed self-reported that they were in the top 10% of leaders. And I'm just going to go the, the backseat of my car now. <laughs> so, you know, whereas that might be true for some of us, that's certainly not true for 90% of us, right? So, I mean, we just have to say like, all right, I can get better at this. Where can I get better? These are things that, you know, these are my goals. This is what I want to do. Help me get there. Uh, and as long as you're open about it. Uh, I think, you know, having been a coach for a long time, I think that works a lot with coaching and, and with you know, athletes. And I think it works with teachers as well. They need to know that you're trying to get better. Well, it's interesting. One of the questions was um, from a participant who says, I'm a parent who's looking for ways to present to my children's administration and school board, how um, a mindset shift to UDL can benefit the whole school, not only my son who has a known disability. So if we even think at the leadership level, when you're thinking about working with your educators, it's not like you're just going to implement UDL for a few of your teachers who may need additional support, but you went in and went about implementing UDL across the board for educators. Is there a connection you might want to make to dig a little deeper on this question um, from Kimberly? Thank you, Kimberly. Yeah. I think it's incredibly important that, that it, as an administrator, if you're trying to implement it in a building, you have to have the support from the top. Like that pressure has to be coming downhill towards you, towards the teachers, not in a way that's threatening, but just like, this is coming. This is, this is good. It's coming. We're not going to expect it to happen right away, but we are all going to be working it for that. And that, that for me was a gift to push my teachers in, again, in a good way, not a harsh way, but just like, we're doing this. So help me help you get on board. Um, and of course you have early adopters who just started killing it immediately. And that really helped to um, kind of utilize them as an example of like, listen to how good this is working in this ELA class or this social studies class, really helpful. And I think one of the things that I've been talking a lot, a ton about lately when I'm presenting is really thinking about, and I've, I mentioned this at the beginning, but this concept of interpersonal variability and then this like intrapersonal variability. So like if all of us on this call went to like a coffee shop and we were given the very firm goal, order like a delicious morning beverage that meets your needs. And we see the coffees and the teas and the waters and the iced and the, you know, the flavors and the creams and the sugars, you know, you know how it all goes. And interpersonal variability is like, if we all go on a given day, we're not all going to order Katie's decaf iced pumpkin latte with cream only, right? Like that's just not going to be everyone's order because we are different from each other. But we forget that like my order is not the same exact every single day. 
And so what we, when we, when we say like UDL is only for students who have like really significant support needs, it's erasing intrapersonal variability that like, when you ask me what I want to drink, it's like, well, how hot is it? Have I had a coffee already? Do they have pumpkin spice available? Do they have soy milk? Cause if they have soy milk, I'd rather have that than whole milk, but I don't want almond milk. Right. And like, there's all of these decisions that I have to make. And it really depends like on the time of day, like if it's night, I'm going to order tea. If I just ran, I just want water. And what we have right now is so many kids who are just so compliant. It's, you know, we have many students who are just way too dependent on adults to learn and every single child, regardless of variability. And especially students who have been historically kind of underserved, like our kids with disabilities and our students of color and our students who are language learners, we need every student to consent to their education, to be given goals and to say, these are potential pathways and given how you feel right now and given the context of which you are being educated, which includes trauma, which includes racism, which includes a lot of other things. What do you need to do to not only learn at high levels, but to feel like seen, to feel supported, to feel challenged. And given that that's a moving target, I can't magically know when a hundred of you come into my coffee shop every day, the exact thing you're going to be in the mood for. So why do we do it in schools? And when we do that, we're actually taking away a student's opportunity, not only to kind of personalize and self-differentiate their learning, but they don't, they don't get to consent. Like they don't have consent to like, this is what I want from this experience. And there are no other places in life that I can think of that does not provide that level of be self-aware, self-reflect, and what do you need? And, you know, when we look at students with really significant support needs, like that's a population who there's so much value in being able to say, this doesn't work for me, or this does work for me. And sometimes we have to modify communication systems like communication boards and assistive technology, but every single student will benefit from self-awareness from learning how to support themselves, learning how to challenge themselves, and then also to have their voice heard. And so like that, that for me is just every kid deserves to know themselves, to advocate for themselves, to develop agency, and to actually be a part of co-constructing their life experience, as opposed to being mere passive recipients of like me choosing my way, which is not everybody's way. Um, but like what I would love messy, to do Messy, Katie, here, that sounds messy and hard to design for. And like, no, it's, so terrible. it's beautifully terrible. <laughs> but again, this is all about feedback is, are we asking parents? Are we asking staff? Are we asking kids? What do you need? Because I guarantee we're not providing all of it yet. And like, this is why if you could, if we could do that two minutes here and Swift could play some music, I would love like a reset time here for everyone to share what they're thinking using the chat, um, to ask more questions, like how do you use feedback in your own practice? So you're continuing to provide the options and choices to create this beautifully messy environment that is necessary because the, the orderly we have now allows about 30% of kids nationwide to meet grade level standards, has really low levels of engagement and teachers who are burnt out, who have nothing left to give, who came to this work because they wanted to give everything. It's too much. And so it's gotta be messy because right now it's not working. And if you told me I had to have your pumpkin spice latte with, I don't even know all those choices, I can tell you right now, I would be defiant and I wouldn't want it. Um, and so, yes, take a couple minutes. Thank you, uh, DJ Swift, for turning on a little music. Please mute it if you don't want it. But how are you using feedback to adjust your leadership practices? All right, Allison, any thoughts from the chat? Oh, there are two that are burning. And then there are a number of others. There's this whole tension of, I need more time. And there's also an interesting um, way of, you know, just trying to think about or question about how do we think about um, students who are engaged versus students who are being compliant. So those are two that have kind of risen to the surface that I would love to hear your thoughts about. I just need more time and engagement versus compliant. I mean, I, in some cases, teachers don't have enough time. So I will, I will certainly say that, you know, my mom taught elementary school, she prepped five classes a day and had like 40 minutes of prep a day. 
that's not enough time. Right? Um, <laughs> but let's say that we do have like a, a solid amount of time. Like when I was, a, I was a middle school teacher, I had like a period a day where I got to work on prep for my own class. And then I had time with my team. Um, and what I found was that I was spending a lot of my prep time doing things for kids that I could have been doing with kids. So I was assessing all their work as opposed to really setting up the environment for peer review and self-reported grading, which is a huge, incredibly high effect size. Um, you know, I was spending a lot of time prepping lessons and coming up with really fun ideas for how students could demonstrate their knowledge instead of actually working with students to do that. Um, my son's kindergarten teacher created a choice board with them on Zoom like last year. She was like remote and she's like, let's create a choice board that we're going to use next week to practice our math facts. Like, what are some fun things that you've like seen or you've heard? And, and, you know, so she's like, I'll put one, like you can practice on IXL math, which is, you know, you log in to a site and some kids really like being on the iPad. Um, another little boy said, I love to make worksheets for myself like two plus two, and then I'll answer them or I give them to my parents and they correct them. And she's like, oh, what a super fun idea. But let's not necessarily um, interrupt the grown up at home to have them finish your worksheet. But it, it's like, I found that the time that I had as I got better at planning with students, as I took advantage of co-planning with my colleagues to develop collective efficacy, I found that I could do it. But I don't want to erase the fact that like elementary teachers with 30 minutes a day of prep, I mean, the, w when are they supposed to, <laughs> to do it? So, you know, I think that we do have to change the system and make sure that teachers do have time for co-planning. Once they have the time for co-planning, then it's all about professional learning on how to plan really efficiently. And both of those things need to be really critical drivers because again, there I could always use more time, but there is definitely like a minimum threshold that has to be, addressed before you can say you have enough time. And there are strategies in the book for the for scheduling and taking a look at scheduling and some modeling ideas. Mike, do you have thoughts about the time? How do you get more time? Oh, well, it's it's difficult, but we've actually had to change schedules. You know, uh, that's a, that's a long term plan that is very unpalatable for many uh, educators. If you've ever gone through it and administrative, it's really difficult. Um, but again, you can you can start small. You don't always have to change the entire schedule. You can make some, certain adjustments that can help, um, you know, maximize the time that teachers have and and hopefully have together. Um, one of the other questions you mentioned was about compliancy versus engagement, and I think I see a lot of this and have seen a lot of this. In fact, I know that my kids are going to be compliant because they probably feel threatened if they don't do what they're supposed to do at school and they're, they're gonna pay attention in class. But you know what we really consider engagement is when kids are struggling and they do not quit. You know? And so a lot of that involves, you know, is it, let's face it, in, our, in the district that Katie and I worked in, most of the kids are gonna be compliant. Even if it was the most boring, dull lesson they've ever seen, they're probably just gonna do what you ask them to do. Um, but if but we nothing started, more. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. I will eat my peas. You give you give students the opportunity to engage in things that learn the way they want to and present the way they want to and show you that they understand in a way that works for them or be able to, you know, touch upon ideas and topics that they like so that they can show you what the standard is. Uh, you're going to get a heck of a lot more engagement. Amazing. Thank Night. you for it. I also think that one of the things that's important for engagement is to recognize the difference between productive struggle and unproductive struggle, because we talk about like, it's the importance of really sticking with something. But like, I know that this concept of grit has been a little bit problematic because let's say the firm goal is go swim. And I, I am not a swimmer. It doesn't matter if you give me extra time. It doesn't matter if you say, just believe in yourself. Like if I don't know how to swim and you throw me in the deep end, it's not productive at all. And I think that that's kind of some of the issues with this concept of grit of like, if you really wanted to do it, Katie, you'd do it. Give me a damn float and a swimming lesson. Right. And over time, you can be sure that I will be swimming. But like, I think that sometimes we think of engagement as like, just, you know, okay. Yeah. So you're interested. Yes. I'm interested. I would love to learn how to swim. So just put in the effort. 
And it's like, okay, but what tools are you going to provide me so that I can? And when we look at those guidelines for just specifically thinking about that, like perseverance and that effort, it's all about like getting a lot of feedback, scaffolds and supports, kind of that different level of challenge. And then the collaboration is allow me to work with a swim instructor, allow me to go in the, the, the shallow end, give me a float, teach me how to swim, but you can't just throw me in and be like, there, go do it. And I think that sometimes, you know, when I've been talking to teachers lately, it's like, so there's almost like two tasks. One is to recognize the barrier of one size fits all and to provide those options and choices. But the other task is really kind of scaffolding and supporting learners to become expert learners. And one without the other is going to be necessary, but not sufficient. And so it's, you know, if we want students to work really hard, we have to make sure that they have the support they need, the opportunities to collaborate, the feelings of motivation, the safety, the, all of that. However, that takes a lot of practice. And so just like we can't expect someone to just go in the deep end and swim, we also can't say, here's six choices, choose, and be like, it's not working be like okay so what supports are we providing to help people make choices what is the 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 classroom that we're creating so we allow revisions and late work so if students do make choices that might not have been the most responsible they're able to learn from that like there's so much that goes into this and I think that sometimes we work with leaders who are like I just want to see you deal in the classroom give choices and then they're like achievements not going up engagements not showing up and so it's it's really kind of deliberate what kind of options and pathways you're creating. Well, that analogy is really helpful because I'm thinking as a teacher, I may not know more than two strategies for swimming. So I might keep saying you cup your hands and you kick faster, cup your hands and kick faster. And if that's not working, I might not know what else to try. So I might throw out my hand saying, I don't have time to figure out other strategies. I don't know where to go for those. I'm going to keep showing you cup your hands and kick faster. So that kind of brings us back to that earlier conversation or the, the point that you're bringing up of the importance of, um, of really building in collaboration and time for teachers to talk together and for leadership to have this open openness to feedback on where teachers are feeling stuck, that then you can provide that meaningful PD to help them learn some of the strategies that, you know, might go into helping. I don't even know what other, you know, that there are some floaties and there are some um, banana things that can help people be able to, um, to swim across the pool. Um, Mike, did you want to add to that? <laughs> I don't think I can top banana thingies. No, <laughs> no, well, no another honestly. Question. Uh, Kate, Kate, I'm glad Katie, Katie mentioned that because if you're not first looking at what barriers exist, then don't worry about the engagement. We need to figure out, make sure everyone can access the, the curriculum and the instruction. And there's also another, another point that was brought up in a number of the comments is it can be really difficult to get feedback and honest feedback and to not have your ego kind of hurt by some of the feedback. So do you have recommendations for administrators as they begin to open up so that you, you have this description of different kinds of feedback and can, as you're sharing about some of these ways, these, these types of feedback, could you also just help wrestle with this? Feedback can be really hard to get sometimes and how do you manage that, especially if it's something new for you as a leader? So this is feedback we received in like a real presentation. And I just think it does such a great, great job of showing like if we really want people to improve and we really want people to be like receptive to improvement, like what's the best way to deliver that? And so kind of this work comes from the book called Thanks for the Feedback by Stone and Heen, who are two professors at Harvard. I love that book. I've like reread it so many times, but they said like there's three types of feedback and they all kind of have their place. But the only type of feedback that really improves performance is coaching or what we call mastery oriented feedback, which is essentially acknowledging what has been done well, maybe evaluating, you know, in terms of some sort of um, predetermined criteria An evaluation is more of like, this is where you stand. This is an opinion. Positive evaluation is considered praise. And then you have this mastery oriented feedback. Now, what I will say is it will, it will hurt your feelings no matter what. Like I've never been able to get beyond seeing like unprofessional or offensive, like without like a moment of like that chest itchiness of like, gosh, like what, like, 
what did I say? Like what, you know, and, and the thing about that, that's so hard is it doesn't refer to anything specific because certainly I say things all the time that are wrong. And I would like to be able to own those things. But when you just have this blanket statement, it's like, well, what, what do you want? I don't even know what to do differently the next time we're together. So for praise, it's great to make people feel warm and fuzzy and it's great for repetition. So if you praise something, you're going to get a lot more of it, which is why Carol Dweck says, praise the effort and not the actual outcome. Because anything you praise, you're just going to get more of. You're not going to get better. You're going to get same. So if it's really praiseworthy, then praise it. Evaluation gives people come some sort of sense of where they are in relationship to like some criteria, but doesn't tell you how to improve. So like if you see a kid 80%, you're going to see your needs improvement. Okay, great. So what on earth do you want me to do about that? So I thought that mastery or interview deck was so brilliant because the person had reported a level of engagement. Like they actually evaluated it as like a positive experience, but was like, I have all these questions because what does it look like if you have kids who you need to pull for a small group, like a Wilson reading for, for, for goodness sake, or what if you have a curriculum that the district is requiring you to use? Like, does that mean you can't use it? And I'm like, oh my gosh such good feedback. I can address that in the next one. Mm -hmm. So in the next one, it's like, here's the feedback. And this is why I'm providing this option for exploration. So you can look at it before and after of something that was adopted, or this is what you can look at how to do this in tier two. Um, and I think that in order to invite that type of feedback, we have to teach people how to give that type of feedback, which clearly you can see we did not do in that presentation because we get a lot of feedback that it's not to say that that person isn't correct. Clearly, I am definitely not exempt from saying things that are offensive in any way, shape or form, and I will own them, but I need to know what they are. And when we say like, let us know how we could improve and be really specific, this is like changing my, what I'm doing moving forward in that like, I'm actually adding a couple slides to ongoing presentations to like say, like, this is the type of feedback I need if you want me to better meet your needs. So I'm not in any way being defensive about the fact that I'm not, is you have to help me understand what I need to do differently. And it's not like I'm automatically going to agree with all of it, but I will acknowledge it. I will hear you and I will respond. And if time continues to be a barrier, then that is something that we then as a system need to think about. We need to grapple with where we're using time and how we're allocating time. And Mike, you talked at the beginning about how in faculty meetings, it used to be an hour of you talking to teachers. So let's say there are more multiple means of how you're getting information to teachers that could free up maybe 45 minutes of a staff meeting that could then be used as time if they're able to get that information they need in other ways. So it might require getting that collaboration to think about some of those continued barriers that may be there. Was there, um, do either of you want to speak to this slide? I uh, well, sure I'll say this, me. given that we're starting the evaluation period right now. Uh, I think it's really important to have upfront conversations with those people we're evaluating. We're going to be providing feedback to about what it's going to look like. So there's no surprises. Like, this is what my goal is. I want to give you, I want to coach you. I want to give you good, you know, definitely identify where things are going well and explain why. And then if there, are, if there's room for improvement, I need to be able to provide that too. And so having those clear goal meetings about what you should expect from me, uh, really lessens the blow of what some people would take as, you know, really have a hard time taking on, uh, I don't even call it critical feedback. It's just coaching, you know, so I'm so used to it now, but not everyone's used to it. So I think it's that, that being upfront and um, clear about what to expect is really important. And it seems like this feedback is really about the design of the learning experience. So it is not a personal thing. It truly is about how we can design inclusive environments that are meeting those needs of, uh, of students, of every student in our system. Um, so I'd love to ask this question. This is one of my favorite questions. And that's, there's so much, I will tell you all, there's so much good in this book there are so <laughs> it doesn't it's looking blurry uh, in the UDL playbook there are so many strategies there are tips there are questions there are ways you can look at the curriculum um, there are ways you can look at schedules as I said the magic of staffing how you can even conduct interviews with new teachers coming in to make sure they get the support but what's something Katie and Mike that you won't find in the book what's maybe a behind the scene moment from the development of the book or time you had to arm wrestle or thumb wrestle each other to figure exactly. something out 
Well, I mean, I think we want to kind of end this webinar by talking about the importance of taking care of yourself. And I, in my role as a leader, got to witness Mike taking care of himself. <laughs> and I walk, this is like my favorite story ever. And all you all know you have something like this as well. Um, and then after that, we would love just to hear your final thoughts about this webinar. But I like walk in, right? I, like I'm a district leader. He's the, he's a principal. And so I walk in and all I can see when I walk in the office is the assistant principal's office. And there's like a brain trust in there that like looks like a scene from like one of those FBI movies where they're trying to like crack a code. They're like leaning over the desk, like bouncing legs, pacing. And there's like six of them in there. And I was like, oh crap, maybe I shouldn't even come. Like clearly something very serious has happened. And so I just kind of like peek in and I see somebody who I know and they're like, oh, we're the MCAS test, like the big state test, which for the love of all that's good, why are we still doing it on paper? Is like coming out and we're like short tests and it's happening, right? Y'all know, like these are the things that take up our time. So it's a very stressful situation. Like, can we even pull off this test? We don't have all the bubble sheets or whatever the heck it is. So people are like really stressed. So I was like, maybe I should come back. And someone in the office is like, oh no, Mike's in his office. Perfect. I'm like, if they're this stressed, Mike must be really stressed. <laughs> and so I walk next door and Mike is in the process of slow mowing a Lay's potato chip. Like, ah, and he's just sitting in his office eating chips. And I was crying. I was laughing so hard. I'm like, do you know what's happening next door? He's like, I just needed a minute. I've been in there all morning. I just needed a minute. But like the juxtaposition between the stress and the chip break. So now like we send each other a lot of chips. So like whenever anything is happening, there's lots of chips being shipped from house to house, but I can't even handle it. It was like, I think your feet might have even been up. As oh. <laughs> That's not true. That is not true. Mike, what's yours? What's your behind the scenes moment? Mine would have to be, um, so Katie, as I mentioned at the beginning, said, you know, we're writing a book together. She didn't even really ever ask me. She just said it's happening. And then um, I, th I think about a week later, I said, you know, we agreed and we're going to the, the mass equity conference. It's like this huge conference for, you know, everyone that believes in, you know, more equity and inclusion and all this stuff. So you walk into this in Massachusetts with Katie Novak, everyone's like, oh, you know, it's like a big deal. <laughs> it's like being with a celebrity. So we sit down, we finally get the two seats and everyone's like coming on. Hey, Katie. Hey, I'm like, yeah, hi, I'm here too. And um, so uh, the potato chips. presenter, Mirko, <laughs> uh, also one of Katie's friends and also a co-author, and she said, oh, I just finished, you know, finished up writing a book with Mirko. I'm like, oh, excellent. So I'm like, all right, let's see what he's got here. And literally went on to deliver the most eloquent, amazing keynote speak, speech I probably ever heard. And she's like, what, what'd you think? And I said, I've never felt more inadequate in my entire life. <laughs> this guy is like so much smarter, more eloquent than I am, just absolutely killed it. And I said, like, now you're writing a book with me. Um, so that, there's a testament like just like you have to believe in yourself you have to have someone that'll believe in you as well even if they catch you eating chips when everyone else is working <laughs> um, and it's that jagged profile you described exactly. so you have a lot of variability in, in everyone he has the hulk hand we've got good visual images to take with us as we know that we can bring on this change in our school and our systems um, we don't quite have two minutes, but we would love to give you a minute to share with us a takeaway that you've gained so far from this webinar, recognizing you haven't probably even opened the book yet. So what's something that you've gained from the webinar? Feel free All to- All right, so Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> Close with that one, eat more chips. That's fantastic. A lot of notes here about feedback, checking traffic reports. Here's an eloquently um, written one that it takes practice designing environments where learners can become experts and active decision makers in their own learning process. I think Dana has writing in her, is her future. I think that's beautifully said. Ask for mastery oriented feedback and then use it. So a lot of notes around the feedback, which is fabulous. I think that was my big takeaway was feedback 
feedback and also this idea to really committing to an ex to being an expert learner. As a leader, you don't have to know it all. You just need to be an expert learner. So the same way Katie modeled being an expert learner at getting on the Zoom, you can be an expert learner <laughs> about, um, about getting this feedback. All of these resources are available in our digital handout. So there's a blog from Mike. There's an amazing article from Edutopia that they've written called Designing a Better Staff Meeting. There's a book club guide. There are two tips for supporting educators that are fantastic. So do you, um, Katie or Mike, do you want to highlight either of these at all? Any of these? Just think of them as a delicious buffet of professional learning and whatever one <laughs> meets your needs is the one that's right for you. We're and again, eat more chips. That is the new tagline. I'm going to go into Target, which is my, my benefactor today. <laughs> and get more chips. So here's a chance for you all to use this code playbook um, 2021 for a 25% discount throughout the month of October. So order it at cat, castpublishing.org. So um, get this book. We also have a cast newsletter. We hope that you'll sign up for bit.ly slash cast hyphen newsletter. There's a Great Lakes UDL experience. Someone asked early on how you can dip your toes in with UDL. Do either of you have a favorite UDL introduction that you like to share? Um, so I, I think that I made a dinner party video. My dad made it for me. And I love the dinner party one just because of the very close um, zoom in on the tuna noodle casserole but i can add that to that digital handout it's it's literally two and a half minutes and it's like a great entryway of thinking about how we know that one size fits all is going to exclude some people and in a very simple way if we were to have people to our house we wouldn't say hey everyone you have to eat the tuna noodle casserole because we just embrace variability and our goal is not tuna our goal is delicious meal and so really thinking about how we approach a lot of other things in our life and bring that into our, our lesson and our leadership design love it mike do you have one do you have a favorite the one that i use that's the one you use the <laughs> tuna all right tuna. <laughs> We also want you uh, want to let you all know, co-founder of CAST and uh, co-author of the UDL guidelines, our own David Rose is coming out with a new mini course. It's virtual. Actually, I should I should emphasize this Great Lakes experience is virtual and online, and so is this opportunity from David Rose. It's starting October twentieth. It's called the Artful Brain. So check it out. It um, he it just runs through a number of different amazing analogies about the brain through art. It's 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 fantastic. I I do want to share my favorite quote from the book um, is a line from John O'Connor, who, Mike, I think you said is an educator in your system. Yeah, he's one of our adopters of our open honors. Fabulous. He says, yeah, oh, check out the open honors section of this book. It's amazing. So he says, come on, take a risk and try UDL. It will reduce wasted effort, time. There's your time, everybody. And reduce wasted emotional energy, tears. This is especially true, I would argue, for those who have been avoiding implementing UDL out of exhaustion. Our task is to, to create an environment that encourages risk-taking, there's that jumping in the pool, and shares ownership with our student. As with all effective universal design, this begins with a first step. So we thank you all for being here today. We hope you will take that first step that you are reflecting on, get that feedback, be expert learners, collaborate with each other. Katie and Mike, any last minute words that you wanna share? Just again, lean into it. It's, it's a journey, lean in, first steps. And then, you know, after Mike has his last word, have Swift dance us out of here. Yeah, I would say that um, we're at a, a perfect crossroads to do this with everything we went through with the pandemic and online and impartial learning. Um, people are ready to take on this challenge. They had to do some things that they didn't want to do. Some of that painful change that they had to encounter, it's already happened. So now's the time. Thank you. And thanks to Mindy Johnson and Nathan Trites and to our captioner and to DJ Swift. Thank you all for being here today. Take care.